Welcome to the Classic Face Rip Podcast. This is issue number five. I'm Vince, and I'm sitting with my two co-hosts, Matt and Nick. Hey, everybody. Hello, everyone. Hello, kaboom, smash, and kabam. <laughs> so this week, we're going to uh, do a little bit different again. Uh, we're actually going to reach into the bullpen this week because we got a lot of good feedback, a lot of emails. We didn't have a chance to get mm-hmm. through any of them the last time. So we wanted to just address a lot of things and answer questions. And, and people always find it interesting just to hear a question and, and you know get an answer. That may, maybe they're thinking the same thing. They just keep forgetting to ask or... Maybe they're afraid to ask because they don't want to ask a silly question because no question is silly. We all know that, but you know, right. some people are, right? Well, isn't it crazy that we're like already doing our fifth issue and we have enough feedback to do like a bullpen show? That's pretty amazing in my opinion. I agree. I mean, it's fun doing a bullpen type show as long as it's not one of those you read the emails word for word because that's a little boring. Right. But I but mean, if someone has a fact that we're only like five issues in and we got so much feedback already, that's fantastic. Well, there's a huge community out there between the the uh, classic Marvel groups on Facebook, the classic Marvel Forever forum, uh, the uncannon uh, Marvel. What's the name of that? Matt, I keep screwing that name up all the time. Yeah, there's classic Marvel Forever and the other is oh, I'm the the un- there's the one unofficial Marvel canon group. That's it. Marvel Superheroes Unofficial Canon Project is the name of the group, which I'm going to put a link in our show notes right this second so you can uh, hit that up. You will have to ask to join. You may have to answer a few questions. I think they modified it, so you have to do that now. But, I mean, as long as you're versatile in anything Marvel or know anything Marvel, you should be able to easily answer the questions. It's not that difficult. Part of that group, it's really neat. Yeah, and and if you do go part of that group, they, they... you'll see like brand new stuff hitting the yeah. hitting now the, the Facebook group constantly. These people like making new pictures, new characters asking for feedback. And then they pi- uh, compile it together on like a giant PDF and they release it for free. Yeah. And w- that group has probably put out more product than actual TSR did for this. Game. Yeah. It's is nuts. In fact, we're going to kind of briefly talk about one of those things here in a little bit. Yeah, but first things first, uh, George Henson wanted me to uh, advise anyone out there who's listening to this that may be part of the group, not part of the group, thinking about creating things, creates things, compiles things, that they are doing a new edition of the Gamer's Handbooks, and they're looking for contributors. Uh, Even, like, one entry is appreciated, so... Even if you have like a little thing to uh, contribute, they'll be happy to include it in. About a third of the entries for the first volume have already been claimed, so you may want to get a hold of him, get to that unofficial canon group, and uh, just you know send a message to George or one of the leadership there and let them know, and they'll hook you up with uh, that information that you need to get started or what whatever his process is. I'm not sure he didn't mm. go into many detail about that, but yeah. So just make sure you take care of that. So we did have one product that was we wanted to talk about real briefly, and then we're going to probably yeah. talk to the person that who, who did this project, probably invite him on the show if we can possibly get him on the show, and maybe we can that would be great. spend an entire issue, you know, kind of going over it, going over his process, how he, you know, came up with things, just kind of like a general interview show. And we want to kind of do this going down the road with all the creators that have the ability to hop on Skype or Discord or even if we have to like call them via phone and patch them in, we have the ability to do that. So we want to do that. We with have everybody. the technology. Yes, if we will build it. Right. Yes. So this released on March third. It was done by Keith Kilburn. He did the Silver Age Marvel role playing game book. What do you guys think of it so far? It's pretty darn interesting. I got to tell you, it's to kind of give everybody a background, just real briefly, mm-hmm. like Silver Age Marvel. He's kind of talking about kind of an era that not a whole lot of people know about, you know? Yeah. I mean, this is kind of like a almost a limbo period between, like, Golden Age and where it gets in kind of the, the modern era, I guess, you might want to say. Generally, yeah. Yeah, yeah it the was... Golden and Silver Age. It's that yeah. dark period there. Yeah, that and where and we were talking about before, it's kind of like covers the era where there was a lot of, more of, like, detective, spy comics, horror comics, but there's still some hero stuff there as well, and a lot of like heroes and villains that you probably weren't even aware of. Yeah. I thought it was really cool. Yeah. I mean, it covers that era when you 
had a far more diverse, more diverse uh, subject matter in your comics. So you had your romance, your westerns, your war, mo- the mo- horror comics were the thing back then. Yes, and it was this kind of era that led to the comic book code, which actually helped create the rebirth of the the superhero genre as we know it. it was as things became a little more kid friendly because comic books were corrupting our youth, according to back in the fifties. Oh yeah. So, so this brings up a lot of like the heroes that were around in that period, like it's like some of the Atlas stuff and timely and those publishers that preceded Marvel in DC yeah. as we know it. And then also it incorporates some of the Marvel characters that they kind of got retconned back into that time period as existing. So it's an interesting hybrid of what actually was and what is technically ish canon now mm-hmm. so it's it's definitely interesting and you'll you'll go and you'll see some of your uh favorites you're like oh i know that character but then you'll be like who's this so uh-huh. yeah definitely worth checking out 190, 192 so we're looking at 200 pages this is probably looking at some of the marvel books that tsr did probably bigger than most of those mm-hmm. yeah because most it. of those were in the 64 to like 128 max and he has wow roughly almost every page every page is full of something it's not like he wasted right. space on this or that or stupid license at the end where someone puts like seven pages of that yeah, this is all for free you can download it right from the group uh, it might be a classic marvel forever.com i'm not positive a lot of the stuff doesn't get there as of late because uh i know the guy who runs the site's a little bit busy so he may be having a you know a behind on uploading something or whatever. But yeah, you can get it right directly from the Facebook group. And he has an advertisement on the back for what's coming soon. And do you see what's coming soon out here? Oh my God, the Asgard yeah. and the Ten Realms. I'm looking. I really want to see that. You see that? I want. Yeah, I want to see um, the monsters unleashed as well. Oh yeah, that, that looks, looks cool really too. Really? Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's stats yeah. for Fin Fang Foom and. Uh, all the other like monster that came out like in the fifties and sixties. Right. Uh, but like this whole product just brief. If you want to find something truly different from what else has been out there for what's kind of, I guess like the mainstream Marvel universe, this if you like a combination of like mystery and spies, supernatural, you know, we're talking like 50s and 60s here, so there might be like you know, we're fighting the communists sort of thing, and yeah, it's it's a really cool kind of mishmash of all that stuff. Truly right. different. Yeah, if you wanted to run like a top secret game using this system, this would be the source book for you. Yeah, it's like if we took Marvel and Top Secret and kind of mashed it together with supernatural elements. There you go. <laughs> He has a big guy advertising at the very end for Marvel Boy, too. That looks really cool, that cover. Yeah. 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 He did a fantastic job. The the, the layout artwork itself, he did a fantastic job. Bang up. Bang it up job. Very much looks like it's professionally done as far as I'm concerned. I mean. Yeah, me too. Me too. Absolutely. You know, I mean, he's missing, like, the little, you know how the, all the TSR books had that little template on the top and bottom? Mm-hmm. Remember, like those lines, and it said Marvel. That's like the only difference between difference. that and something that TSR did, and that's not. I could care less about that, but if right. Those, I think, you know those picky people out there, but yeah, yeah. And I think there was something style. They even had a conversation about stylistic choices when it comes to that, because that format is for the more towards the older, yeah, the, yeah, the, the later in the life uh, span of the system. They were using more of that format as opposed to the the format you were just mentioning yeah so if you compare like the early books with the later books this is closer to towards the later books very true yeah good yeah. point i didn't think about that okay well, well we yeah. really need to see if we can get them on the show and talk about this one book we can you know break it down and have a big old session with them that'd be awesome if we could do that yeah, definitely. We'll, we'll plan that for a future episode when we get further down the line and we yeah. can get line up some people because it's a little bit hard doing that sometimes with people and schedules mm-hmm. and everything. So, I want to play 3D, man. 
<laughs> so take a look. Go go to the uh, Facebook and Canon group uh, project group and uh, go download this now and uh, give your feedback and support his project. See, he's doing yes, it for pause, free. Pause the show. Download it now. No, 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 no. Don't pause the show. Do okay. it after the show. Write a note to yourself. Put it in your phone. Say Siri. Yeah. Give me a note and then do that. Or I, Alexa, I, whoever else. <laughs> Yeah, I do have one question. Can I still get the Polar Polaris nuclear sub for a six ninety eight that's advertised in this? That supplement? has the Hydra emblem on it. Yeah, yes. I wonder. <laughs> um, I would think if you sent away for it, you're probably never going to get an answer. Yeah, oh. probably. Also, the rubber masks that you can get, like of you know, of vampires and stuff. Yeah. Though it would be funny if you sent away for it and they actually sent it to you, like, hey, here you go. It's like what? <laughs> Here's your nuclear, nuclear like, sub. Yeah, 30 years. <laughs> oh, or you get the soil from the Tome of Dracula. <laughs> yes. That was cool. I saw that. I'm like, wow. The advertisements really make this thing, too. Yes. I. That's one thing about modern comics I miss. I miss the, miss the wacky whole... advertisements. That's... Yes. Those yeah. were so much fun. For, you know, sea monkeys. Uh, the George the Atlas book. Yes. Yeah. The, they, the, they ship the, you the a guy pet who's month. like the master of kung fu. Remember him? He had the yeah. he he had like the Van Dyke beard with the big afro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or the people, that, or being able to buy a pet monkey or a raccoon through the mail. Yes. Miss some of those. I remember the All ones right. where the, it was on the back page, like you know, buy like you know, five hundred Roman soldier toys for four ninety five or something like that. All right, well, well, we'll save this for the show when we talk to him directly. So let's yeah. uh, get moving on things here. So, okay, you can reach us by emailing us. How, Matt? What's our email address? Our email address is bullpen at classicfacerip.com. So, and you can email us here, and uh, we will read your emails on the show. And we love hearing your feedback. And uh, maybe if we get another enough backlog over time again well you'll get another bullpen show there we go so let's head on to those emails yes all sir. right the first one we actually got a nice long one here from steven watson who has all just all kinds of ideas and thoughts uh, let's we'll just start digging into this uh he first starts talking about uh we were mentioning random tables. He mentioned what uh, holograms. It reminded him of a plot used by his players in a ses in a solo session he was running. They had con the, uh, the heroes had light control powers and phasing, and they could tinker with weapons. And they had the response archival responsibility for disasters through every part of life named Master Nemesis. The other players attempted to judge for the first time and opted to use. Their shared campaign, but run solo sessions to get their feet wet. So it, it looks like they're doing a uh, one shots at the same time, passing off the uh, judging duties. Mm -hmm. So that would actually even be a way to. That's one thing about the system. It it actually does lend itself well to one shots too. So if everyone oh, yeah. kind of wants to play, no one really wants to judge. You can all do a bunch of one shots, and it'll still feel like a cohesive game. Yeah, well, good point. Uh. And he said the solo hero here is essentially a vigilante on the run from shield, but had like a corporate sponsor. And then that master nemesis was apparently meant to be unique in the time stream and would not generate a temporal duplicate. Oh, because they were, that's right. He was had a campaign that involved some like wacky time travel involving Kang. Yeah. I remember reading some of the other those. That's right. Yeah. So eventually the uh, the villain did a monologue through a hologram in his base as the hero arrived. So, yeah, that, that's always a classic there. The uh, You show up, you get taunted by the villain, but it's not actually there. It's just like either the Doombot version of Doctor Doom or the right. hologram or the stunt. Why am I picturing or... like Emperor Palpatine as a hologram, you know? Yes. Your rebels your rebel shall be crushed. <laughs> Yeah, so he decided that. So, the, what the heroes, since they had light powers, decided to use them to uh, over lay a hologram of himself over this form and yeah. over his true form. During the monologue, the solo was told that the opportunity was gone. The master nemesis beyond his reach until the solo opened a full salvo on the enemy's hologram, which it over overlay. So, my friend had. Uh, 
The hero had the ultimate weapon, name it Nemesis. So basically, it was like a hologram, but somehow with the, using his light powers and everything, was able to. It was like an overlay on top of the villain, and they, so the hero was using their light powers to, a, to basically attack through the hologram. I was just gonna say he attacked through the hologram. Oh my gosh, that's pretty smart. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the hero had the ultimate weapon, named it the uh, Nemesis, dead to rights, no escape. Uh, got past the Zen, zeroed out the health, and then the remains were incinerated with warp grenades and a cloud laser. So he added spray to lasers. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yes, because when when the single point isn't good enough, you need that like the spraying laser buckshot. Yeah. And then, by this point, the heroes were have been listed by various origins in the. Okay. Yeah, cybernetically enhanced breed mutant considered god of lizardmen on Lost Island, armed with magic gun, with time displaced children on a vendetta to keep their mother from mating with him. <laughs> wow! Wow! <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a thing. That's a ta- that's, a, that's a weird tangent. <laughs> that it is. It's yeah. like it's, it's almost like that Skull the Slayer comic, <laughs> right? That actually is something I wouldn't be shocked if Skull the Slayer eventually battled. Yeah, <laughs> and and then he just goes on and starts talking about how he he got all of his materials through his college roommate, mm-hmm. and then that they would when they would create their characters, they would randomly generate the characters through the die rolls, but yeah. the judge was the only one to record the results. So they would have to learn their abilities the hard way. So basically imagine you roll your character, you create it, but you don't actually have the stats for it. You don't get to actually look at it. You could just say, I want to do this <laughs> and see if oh, you can do it. Oh, that is wild. Oh, okay. I see now. Wow. Yeah. That's so you're literally nuts. discovering your character's powers. That kind of, right. that kind of reminds me of play. like how they used to do, how they said that D&D was supposed to be done. When right. only the, when the, you, the GM or the DM only knew everything, he rolled everything, you just said what you wanted to do, and you had to kind of go off what he said. I like that. Wow. That's actually a cool idea. It is. Right. It is. And that actually, yeah, especially if you're doing, like, say, like a mutant character, like the, you generate when their power generates as a teen, you would mm-hmm. roll your base stats, and you'd kind of have an idea of where you are, but you wouldn't – I would even say – you yeah, you would roll your character, but roll – the powers, yeah, I would even say you would roll the numbers, like, but not actually even exactly know what your powers are until they manifest. And then you kind of have to try to try different things to figure out exactly what they right. are. Peter Parker didn't know he can like climb walls and stuff like that, right? At the very when soon as he got bit, it was all right. by accident. <laughs> right. So you could actually by doing that recreate that process. And then as you get more comfortable, then the DM can start revealing or the, the judge could start revealing, hey, this is your power. Okay, this I, is your rank. I'm gonna climb as to the top ability and jump. Okay, you die. What? <laughs> yep, you're dead. I I, this I is guess what you would have been. <laughs> yeah. So no, that is actually a really interesting concept I never thought of. Yeah, that is. That's actually pretty cool. Yeah, and then he talked about they they were also the as teens as well. So he talked about one time that his character got grounded for missing curfew, <laughs> but he had to meet up with a gang elsewhere at a specific time or because pl- he basically had to go deal with a gang, but he ended up missing curfew oh. and got grounded because of that. So that is very Marvel. Sounds like the day of life of kick ass. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So. So, yeah, so he got grounded, so he couldn't go meet up with this gang, so he ended up, like, having to sneak out the bedroom, went to a convenience store to get orange juice, and it was just, like, a small throwaway thing to do. Just, so it's just one of those, like, hey, I'm going to do this uh, role play. And then he was told there was no orange juice. He grabs apple juice. It was empty, too. Minute made. Nope. Empty. Every Basically, every time he tried to get a drink of something once his powers manifested it they were ended up empty and this was part of him discovering what was going on and then it was like same brain all trying to get back to the on boards the... yeah so basically it was like all the juice was empty and then he had to get back on the railroad ex- 
and he was trying to get me to get back on the railroad express. So in other words, the players started to like kill time just to figure out what's going on by going to a convenience store to get a drink. And the judge was like, Oh no, there's nothing in this one. There's nothing in this one. He was trying to railroad him. Yeah. Yep. Was it an embargo? Did all the fruit pickers go on strike? Had someone tampered, with, tampered the juice? with the juices? It was a plot to force us to drink Slurpees and pop. As a master plan of big sugar? Yeah, yeah. probably. <laughs> right. It was a major metropolitan sprawl that takes a while, even with hyperspeed. He never did suffer a gang initiation with the character. So I guess he was like looking to join a gang. Hmm. But yeah, it was like, what? He, that's weird there's no more fruit juice there's no more fruit juice no you must drink the slurpee big mm. slurpee oh. well but, they uh, say big gulps and big slurpees can poison your body to the fact that you'll die. never mind <laughs> Ooh, what if that is how the mutation was started or triggered you got yes. altered that way by drinking the slurpee it's like something something went wrong with the Slurpee machine, and they put like the wrong chemical mixture in it. And next thing you know, you have superpowers. The same stuff that fell into the sewers that created the turtles got into the. This, the isn't Slurpee that like machine. a Halloween Simpsons episode or something? That probably knowing the Simpsons, yeah, it probably been done. Probably. I think that wasn't there a link between what was it the slusho slushies and the Cloverfield monster. <laughs> Was it there? Uh, I think that was a thing. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. And then uh, Steve and also goes to bring up the old miniseries Marvel Apes. Something I've oh, not wow. thought about in years. Basically wow. where a uh, char- uh, character from Spider-Man's early days, the Gibbon, <laughs> ended up on an alternate Earth. Where all the Marvel characters were primate versions of themselves. A planet oh. where apes evolved from men? That was right. right. Yeah. I forgot about yeah. that. Yeah. That would actually be interesting to look at some of those weird Marvel offshoots like Spider Ham and Peter Porker Peter and Peter Porker, the amazing Spider Ham. The Pun Fisher <laughs> and Yeah. Cause yeah, there was a, that whole time in the eighties when they were doing it. All kinds of wacky parody stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that'd be interesting to look at those. And if if you wanted to run a superhero comedy game, there you go. Oh boy! And then he has on the next paragraph. This actually really intrigues me. Yes. Yeah. And then he also talks about the Hulks from Old Man Logan. Yeah. And that had basically being inbred hillbillies born from she Hulk and She Hulk. And then that Logan was responsible for mastering the X Men because Mysterio had him seeing everyone as a villain and going goading him into going into berserk. Yeah, and another reality for a campaign he brings up the Marvel Manga Verse, which I not really, I vaguely remember them becoming out where they was all done in the manga stuff, but I've never read them. So yeah, that's just something I don't know about how and how it actually differs from the regular Marvel universe. So that'd be something. Into. Yeah, the 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 Hulks from Old Man Logan. Yet that whole, all that Marvel timeline. Yeah, that's a pretty tragic story. Yeah, <laughs> that's a just. I've got a few issues of it, and I just like no, thank you. Just not what I'm looking for out of a superhero story. I know some people love it, and it's it's. I don't like it in the same way I don't like Game of Thrones. It's like I can acknowledge, you know, it's probably really good. It's just not for me. And that's what Old Man Logan was. And I'm a Logan Wolverine fan. And I'm just like, wait, wait, no. wait, wait, what? Wait, wait, what? You I don't like Game of Thrones. You don't like? I made it 20. Wait a minute. Oh, hold on. I'm hearing the words. I made they, it 20 they... minutes into the first episode of it and shut it off because I'm like, they're all a bunch of bleeps. I hate them all. I want Galactus to devour Westeros. They don't deserve wow. to exist. Wow. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of with Matt. I I don't I'm not I couldn't I dropped off after season one. I, I was just really? meh. It's basically it's a snuff film for fantasy. I wouldn't say it's, that, but it just wasn't for me. It, that's all. Everyone dies. Anyone you like's going to die. You know, evil's going to win because it's J.R.R. Martin, and you know his world outlook. Yeah, it's very bleak. I keep wanting to say J.R.R. Tolkien. I know. <laughs> How dare you? 
quite the opposite. <laughs> yeah, it's that. Yes, it's George R. R. Martin. As my wife is yelling from the other room because she actually enjoys the show, but for some reason I keep wanting to call him J. R. R. Martin. I don't know why. I'm confused. Maybe it's it's the fact that the Lord of the Rings books. I just I never could get myself to actually be able to read them. Mostly. Oh <laughs> but, uh, yeah, reading them is even worse. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's just he, he would go in weird tangents of like describing a tree for five pages, and it's just like um. I found the books huh. too, the books too depressing to read. I was just kind of getting sad after reading those books. I mean, I know they're great books, but I don't know. I got yeah, sad. and I think that's also part of the reason I don't like Game of Thrones, and I don't like Old Man Logan or anything. I don't enjoy dystopian. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't enjoy dystopian. I don't like downers. Hence. <laughs> Is that your wife yelling at you again, or is that a cat? Yes, it, that is my wife yelling. <laughs> oh, okay. Was it just a cat? Okay, so. cool. <laughs> yeah, this also comes from the person who doesn't like The Walking Dead either, so. Exactly. So at least I'm consistent. <laughs> That's true. At least you are consistent throughout the years. Yes. Yeah, and then he also, Stephen, goes into talking about how his players actually worked out a new spot in their world. And then... Uh, that the, they had a couple players. The two of them kept their creations with them, like shouting distance. So like one of them had like a Moro Island Republic in the Pacific Ocean with a backstory. It was like a pirate free port that mocked the governments of target nations with corrupt parodies and a true functioning shadow government behind it. Had like a Buccaneers code as well as a Magna Carta. Eventually the facade was seen through by other nations as a legit as legitimate by World War One and Two efforts, chicanery still abound. It did become a refugee medical research and technology and upgrade. Uh, in the campaign world, Roddenberry moved Star Trek to MRI and was still alive in our campaign. Okay. You moved Star Trek to Mir? Yeah, to, no, the Moro Island Republic. That's the name of the island. Oh, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, and then the, the, then there was another the, the other player created another island paradise called Vandu. Then it got nuts, he says. Which considering what some oh, of his oh, then other, it got nuts. <laughs> right, considering what some of his other players have done, I'm like, okay. He created a new species of big cat called Van Cats, engineered both for size and reflex, but with psionic abilities and sentience. Ugh. He had the cats recognized by laws of voting citizens. <laughs> Thundercats, oh! Yeah. Uh, the advanced energy, energy energy generation tech and structural engineering forces were a headache for world politics. So basically, you had a high-tech race of cat people that had a seat at, like, the UN. Thundercats. Yeah, pretty much, actually. More advanced than the Thundercats, but yeah. Right. Colony pods on the ocean floor beyond the 12 mile radius, mm -hmm. the coastline, stealth aircraft with energy weapons, subs, Submarines outnumbering, outnumbering NATO. NATO. <laughs> wow. Imagine and subs with strips of vibranium running fore and aft, defeating sonar and depth charges, armed with quantum torpedoes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Speaking of uh, super villains, <laughs> that, that, hey, if you wanted like a super villain threatening, wanting to take over, that's more like a Bond villain almost, actually. Yes. Mm -hmm. The private island. Super tech subs, just throwing in sentient Has cat. His wife cat on his on his lap. Right. Fire the quantum torpedoes. <laughs> yeah, and then he all he goes on to talk about. He had a character named Shakedown. He was uh, in years before the Deadpool movie. Yes, before the Deadpool movie, with water freedom, water breathing, iron will, body armor, thermal vision, vibration, and vibration control. Wow. That's a lot of powers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And his talents were law enforcement and genetics. Instead of making him like C a CSI, he worked as a detective on the 13th District of New York, NYPD. Uh, the thermal vision was built into a full suit of body armor. All right. Okay, so he <laughs> was on an undercover operation to shake down. He ended up taking on a superhuman crime cartel known as the Zodiac Ring. Oh, Which cool. actually, that would be an interesting little group. You have 12 villains. There's your They're super all based off the signs of the There's... Zodiac? Yes. That would be cool. Well, you already have Scorpion. What was Scorpio? <laughs> well, yeah. No, no, there actually is a Scorpio. Oh, right. Yeah, because he's got the Scorpio key. 
Oh, so. let's save that for our next episode. Good idea. Yeah. Shh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> yeah, one of the Zodiac fighters got a grand slam and knocked him through a warehouse wall into the river. In a van Big... down by the river. Oh. Yep. <laughs> Big mistake as the foe leaped to attack, <clears throat> attack Shakedown in the water, where basically, if you've been paying attention, all of Shakedown's powers are water based. Water based. <laughs> Uh, he he did a vibration controlled firing like sh- basically shot the river at the villain and then the vibrations moved faster th- the, through water than the air the battle had drawn the Avengers to the warehouse and then the vibration blast cleared the water from the riverbed up one length of Manhattan Island falling as a rain so basically he took a river from Manhattan shot it at a villain and then that water still had to go somewhere and basically caused it to rain in the city so how are you attacking the villain i'm throwing the river at him (laughs) yes the impact was enough to stun the avenger assembled avengers shakedown arranged the bodies of avengers and zodiac reads to spell out the name shakedown (laughs) So he took the oh unconscious bodies of the villains That's and the Avengers up. And That's using Cap up. Shield as the O. <laughs> oh my god, that's messed up. Yeah. Then I had one foe slung over shoulder and disappeared. Took took the headline photo away from Web Spider-Man in the Daily Bugle. I'm like, yeah, I could see that happening. And now there's the newest villain in town, Shakedown. Because hmm. now, if the Daily Bugle's running your photo, you know they're going to not like you. That's correct. And then we also got a submit. Like, there's a Princess Bride RPG out there. So, who did this? He, this was uh, Steven as well. Oh, okay. He submitted stats for the Princess Bride. Yeah. Yeah. So we could throw these up in the uh, show notes here. So for those, but yeah, we got. The Sicilian Mastermind. We got Enigo Montoya. Inigo Montoya. Yeah. Dread Pirate Roberts. Right. Miracle Max. Count Rugen. Yeah. We just did not get Princess Buttercup. I'm disappointed. <gasps> oh. Yeah. And then we got... He also goes into just uh, using the system for other games other than superheroes. So... And like Westerns, Romance, basically all those comics we had talked about from the uh, Silver Age supplement. You can mm-hmm. do all, all of those in this system, but then you kind of run <coughs> excuse me, run into some issues from the karma system. Because it's mm-hmm. very much – the karma system is very much based on the comic code authority idea of what a good guy is. Right. So he lays out some ideas for like a Western and how to adjust the karma system to actually award be role playing in that Western. Because sometimes in a Western, you're going to end up killing people and it shouldn't cost you your karma because that's kind of how things were handled back then. That's like the code in, of the law, West. So. The law of the West. Right. So like just, well, I'll just run through some of the stuff he lays out. Like, like you get in a bar fight. Minus five karma. Yeah, bar fights happen a lot. And that's why it's like a five karma hit. They happen a lot. They know what's going to happen. So, But you shouldn't do it. So it's like a minus five. Oh. He, yeah, he still has just like murder losing all karma. But some other things to consider is like cattle wrestling, horse stealing, like treason. Was Square it? dancing in a roundhouse. Right. <laughs> like extortion. <laughs> Like violation of burial grounds, mm. yeah. I mean, so he just lays out some uh, settling on Indian lands, just some other th- lays out a few ideas to just yep. adjust the karma system to fit the genre you're using if you're going outside that superhero system. So, and that's actually something to consider if you want to try to delve into something more than just superheroes with this that karma system will need to be tweaked to get the feel right. Otherwise you're going to be encouraging types of activity that uh, aren't necessarily thematic. So like if you get karma bonuses for doing stuff that doesn't fit with the campaign, it 
yeah, so make sure you brings up a good point to adjust that. And then Stephen goes on to go talk about our Bound for Glory podcast. That was fun. I like that podcast. I had a lot of yeah, fun doing I did that. Too. Yeah, it's fun to go and especially when you find those obscure characters you don't really know about that had like a brief point in time. And looking back at it with modern eyes, one, it gives you a good social commentary like we brought up. And also, you could just get a feel for how the genre is still trying to evolve as well. It, I would say in some ways, old, your older comics were far more diverse than like. Oh, yeah, I would comics. say so. I would say so, yeah. So that's always fun to go back. Yep. It was like. And he brings up, uh, he, he had the idea is like if Fox, Sony, and Marvel have made a deal allowing all the characters in like all the movies. The characters? The... Characters. Yeah. Stop it. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, like, uh, I know he's talking about characters, your comic book characters, like how like Fox has some, Sony right. has some, Marvel has some. If they all got together and had the one massive Marvel movie. Well, they're they're so scarce out between some. Like I just found out, I was reading some of them that that Universal Pictures owns Namor. Like they're like, why do they own that one product out of anything? It's weird. Right, because they probably bought the rights like back in the '90s and just kept renewing it and never got around to doing anything with it. That's how a lot of that stuff happened. Oh, like what happened with the Fantastic Four, probably. Right. Mm. That lame Roger Corman film that came out in the '90s and right. Just the, just to hold on to the rights. Well, no, it was his rights were about to expire. Yeah. And so he had to, ru if he was going to do anything with it, he had to rush something out. Just, it was, he was going to lose them no matter what. So it didn't let him keep the rights. It was, you're going to lose these. So <laughs> rather than take a wash on the licensing fee, rush that out. Hmm. Which I watched and it's hilarious. So I recommend it. Just like I recommend finding the 90s uh, Justice League show. Oh, my gosh. I remember that very briefly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. There's lots of really bad. Or the 1970s Doctor Strange is good as well. <laughs> oh, I remember that. We were watching that on TV as a kid. Yeah. But but anyways, back to the bullpen. Uh, he, he says he could see Chris Evans and several of the Marvel comic universe actors welcoming peers into the greater Marvel universe with the Mary Marvel marching, marching society going lady. from the back lots to the city streets going around and all of them joining up. Uh, basically. Yeah. Basically you just lay it out. Like you have all these actors show up at like Stan Lee's door that play all the superheroes and, but yeah. And then you can see each late night host taking part in it in the filming portions. Basically he laid out a whole PR campaign to joy the Marvel universe the movie universe is together as one. So, yeah. And he was like, some inspirations from it were for like Bing Crosby's Holiday Inn, Austin Powers, Blazing Saddles, and the Blues, Blues Brothers. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. But, yeah. And then we wow, got okay. a, one more from him where he is, uh, he, which is the, the Conan project that was on development hmm. uh, from the classic, uh, the unofficial Canon Facebook group. And there was a, uh, he recalled the, the completed and posted adventure on classic Marvel forever, where it had, that's the storyline where Colin Gath uh, transformed Manhattan into a Hyborian age version. That'd be the cool for plot. Yeah. The mutants were made the sorcerer's goon squad. Spider-Man hunted and could not communicate because he was unaffected by the transformation. People entering the affected region fell under the spell and spoke the common tongue. Hmm. Well, cool. In, in, in some way, yeah, that's almost like Once Upon a Time, the yeah. television show. Yeah. yeah. The, which actually, that's something else you could do in this system, Once Upon a Time, with the RPG. Oh, wow. I guess you could, couldn't you? Yeah, because they have magic. They have everything that fits. They have the uh, iconic characters with. They have the sword fights and all that. Oh, so yeah, good you, point. the monsters yeah, of the could. week. Yeah, it's amazing how versatile the system could be. <laughs> right. It's like it, you're just like you say it. You're like 
as a joke, you're like, no, wait, actually, that would work. We could do, yeah, we could do this. Yeah, yep, 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 that works. Yep. And then we got an email from Keith and Killboarded, the, who uh, he's the one who wrote the uh, supplement we talked about earlier, the Silver, yep, Age. Silver Age. So, yeah, just, and apparently he's also done some stuff for, if you're into Star Wars D6. He did uh, some supplements for that as well. So mm -hmm. hunt down those Star Wars D6 groups and you can find some of his work there because it's looking at – I haven't seen his D6 work, but I but looking at this, I'm like, it would definitely be something to check out if you're into that system. Yeah. So and hopefully we'll be able to work something out to get him on the podcast. That would be great. He's, he's asking, so I can't see why not. Right. Well, his people will talk to our people. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And then we got our last one here from Bruce B. It, Hello, Bruce. Hello, Bruce. Not yeah, Bruce. he just says he was a huge Marvel fan back during the so-called Bronze Age in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And then his comic collection went away. I had <gasps> cut them all up as a kid to play with the drawings like figures. What? <laughs> yeah. Then he, then he found the, like, the essential Marvel reprints in bookstores and was able to recreate his collection, which point if you needed those essentials to recreate your collection, that really makes me sad because those yeah. issues Is are he, classic. Actually, I'm thinking about that. Is Bruce the owner of Barataria Games? I might be, The actually. one that does the OSR supplements? Cause I think so, from his email. Yeah, that's what I was just looking at. I recognized the name, and I was just like, hey, I recognize that name. And I remember talking to him a while back. He's a cool guy, man. I wonder what happened. He was producing a lot of stuff for a while. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, and then he and then he went and just goes on. Is like I, he, he posted over in the OSR forums, but mm -hmm. this, but he, yeah. But he emailed it in as well. He's like, he would thought it would be ridiculous to do a primer on a 30-year-old game and that he questioned whether or not it could be useful. But he actually thought it was great. I mean, he enjoyed... He thought the reviews of the iterations of the games and books were helpful. Uh, like I, he throws in that he disliked the random character generation, so he like he got some use out of the point build. Actually, mm. a, a primer checklist thing probably would be interesting for this game if someone put that together because I know I saw a few people asking for it and there never actually was one done by TSR. It was always just read the book. <laughs> right. It. Yeah, because you could... This system, really, you could streamline mm. a lot to get, to get to the basics of this, 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 and here you go, have fun. And just a way to get people into the system even quicker even though it's not like these rule books can when compared to other rpgs of the time they're actually pretty easy to read and uh, small compared to some of the dense books from other publishers and even tsr and then and he also says at first he wasn't excited to hear when the feature on our uh bound for glory episode it was like uh recapping old comics but he's like oh he enjoyed that too because again like we kind of mentioned earlier it's like he skull for him skull the Sclayer came out right when uh he was reading his comics but he never read it it was like oh i heard of that and never thought about it again mm -hmm. so he but now it he was like he listened to the show and he's like oh i want to go back and read that and that's what actually what i'm finding too is as i as we start digging into like some of these obscure things i'm like oh i want to actually read that because there's a lot of treasures hidden and i think that's something we can help bring out on this podcast too through yep. when we do our bound for glory shows and then now he, he says he wants to go back and read several books like captain marvel and power man that were over his head at the time, but he's like come, he's kind of come around on him because yeah, like Power Man, another one of those, a very much a microcosm of the time. So you could actually kind of get a feel for society back then, and it's you'll find lots of social commentary in Marvel comic. Oh yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then he said, got him thinking back to the good old days that may have fallen by the wayside, care with the character books he's loved to look at but just 
never got around to like the faux San Francisco Bronze Age campaign that might inspire you in the future. Uh, the first that comes to mind is like Micronauts, a toy tie-in that he remembered loving to read, but had no recollection of any of the stories. I remember the Micronauts. I, I remember do the remember the comic book. But I don't remember anything they did. I don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember any of the biggest content. I remember the character Bug. I remember. Uh, what the hell was another one? Oh, heck, I don't remember. That's the only one I can remember. Yeah, and then he also brings up Rom the Space Knight. Another yes. one. Yes. Like, I remember the name. Couldn't tell you what he did. You know what? That one became quite integral to the Marvel universe for a while. The dire wraiths, his enemies of Rom, okay. where he tries to hunt them down with his a neutralizer. Yeah, and then he also another one, series that he's been revived is uh, Nova because I think that are working that into the top, the un movie universe at some point. So you get mm -hmm. the cosmic campaign. So he's kind of been dipping back into that. And then world war two was a popular subject for both Marvel and DC. So he was like ghost tank. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I, I have the hero click for the ghost tank, <clears throat> but I've never actually read anything of it. Uh, and the, they, then they had all just the various straight up war comics, like, the Howling Commandos and Sergeant Rock. And, yep. And then you had, uh, like, Nick Fury in all of his World War II exploits. Yep. Sergeant Rock is a DC uh, character. Yeah, too. Sergeant Rock is DC. I remember reading a lot of Sergeant Rock when I was a kid. Yeah. And then the Bro Marvel Bronze Age, he brings it brought back like Captain America, Bucky, the Android Human Torch and Submariner cuz you remember all those were out in the 40s predating Marvel. Yep. Yeah. And they were yep. brought back when when the as Marvel was buying other comics companies. And then like Liberty Legion, it actually you'll find it thrown back to this supplement some of these characters in the uh Silver Age supplement we talked about because mm -hmm. it's all falling right around that same time frame. Yeah, you're right. Mm. So very topical. But mm -hmm. yeah, running a game back in the 40s with this would be good as well. I mean, just that in that World War II era, what are the superheroes doing during World War II? <laughs> we know what Captain America is doing, but what's Namor doing? How? What does he think of the battles of the? Uh, surface dwellers. He and was how... he was fighting along with Captain America, if I recall. Right. Namor sitting right. at home wishing he had a movie out. Yeah. <laughs> and then, then he also talks about how we started. We mentioned he mentions Top Secret as well, mm. is using it as inspiration for some of this those characters as well. And he does like the opera. He also mentions like Operation White Box. Dogs of War, and then there was the Agent Thirteen source books, Mercenary Spies and Private Eyes. Use those type, steal yeah, using other games as resources for just theming. I think would be is great. Like when we had mentioned with Top Secret, there's a lot of good just resource books for the time period and the tech level, and also just the philosophy that you can go ahead and steal and bring into the game. So steal from other game systems and bring it into this great one. Yeah. <laughs> and then he mentions our discussion of using Marvel for a uh, fantasy gaming mm -hmm. back when uh, people started turning out clones for systems back. So it was like four colors and, and such. So he, he thinks that'd be cool to talk about. And since Marvel seems to be abandoned where anyway, maybe talking about the clones themselves. Yeah. Well, there's a couple of them out there you can look at. I mean, <clears throat> I like some of them, like 4C, and I've actually been looking at uh, Jay Libby's uh, G Core a lot lately, and uh, I think that's really cool what he did. He kind of modified it a little bit, so it's not exactly a clone, so I don't know if you guys have seen it or not. You may want to take a look at it. It's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, because you, you have to remember with – the Marvel system as it is in the books is very much from with an 80s design philosophy. Yeah. And so 
when you start looking at it with modern eyes, you'll be like, would they still do it that way? Yeah. And no. And these retro clones and like Jay Libby's uh, G -Core. reworking of the rules, you get to see a little more modern. And so it's always interesting to see just how the rule sets evolve. So yeah, yeah. it's definitely something to check out. And then, and now we've emptied out the email bullpen, but we also have one on our website because you can yep. ac actually go to our website, classicfacerip.com, and also leave comments on our show there and we will get them. So, Ew. first one we got here is from Chuck. Chuck. Like nice Chuck. Chuck. Got nice podcast. You guys reference it. I think it was a series of hodgepodge of topical issues in pop culture of the time, like Westworld, the. The land yeah, he's, I forgot. he's talking about that Skull the Slayer episode. That yeah, had, this is a comment from Skull the Slayer, yeah. Yep. And he was like, besides all the story elements of robots, time travel, aliens, etc., giving the book a somewhat convoluted feel, I think the bigger part of the problem was the tremendous amount of shuffling of creative team on this book. There was, was like, quite a bit of editors moving around between them. He listed the three of them, which I kind of noted that it was doing that, like back and forth, and then Marv came back and then was gone. It's like, what were they doing? They had, yeah. what, three different editors, he said, three different writers, yeah. three, three different, different pencil pencilers, <laughs> and a variety of different inkers, colorists, and letterists. That's why it uh, felt so disjointed. I, I could see the different pencilers, the different inkers, things like that. The writers and the editors is where I think is the major thing that probably disjointed everything on that. Yeah, right, because it, it, you couldn't quite get the feel. Is it supposed to be a the vet coming from home to a country that doesn't want him story, or is it this time travel land before time story hmm. or, or is it a commentary on the various uh, racial and gender issues of the time? Who knows? Ex and I think that's probably why you got, I think your answer is yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's all of that because it's, you no. had three different editors. <laughs> it would be interesting to go back and actually look at the theming of the different issues and try, see if you can pinpoint, okay, this editor was pushing this part of the story compared to this editor and this writer. So. And then he, he also wrote in, it's been a long time since he played the game, but he thinks that my stats on Skull are a little closer on the mark. And he's uh -huh. not so sure about that monstrous energy strike thing. I don't, that's what I thought. Yeah. And then he also put on a final note. He wonders the series wasn't rushed out to beat DC's The Warlord of similar series. I think it was. You might be right. I was I looking forgot up, about that. Yeah, I was looking up after he mentioned that comment, and I was looking at The Warlord. I'm like, you know what? I bet they tried to rush this out well before The Warlord so they can capitalize on it before him. Right. And then... He gets the he puts he thinks that Skull the Slayer was never intended to be part of the Marvel universe, but mm. change once they did that Marvel two in one where they pulled him back, which was written and edited by the original creator Marv Wolfman. Hmm, quite possible that was the intention was never to bring him in, but maybe the sales were good enough and they're like, hmm, let's try to see what we can do now. And or it was just Marv. Hey, I want to bring back my pet. <laughs> guy that might have been part of the deal with bringing marv back in he said hey i want to bring back skull the slayer and they were like all right sure all right sure we can always throw him back in the time vortex if we want yeah right sure which is kind of actually what they did <laughs> but uh then we also have some comments from the facebook uh or i know actually these are more website comic yeah web comments yep uh, this one is from Michael. He's like, could you do a show on NFL Super Pro? I could, I forgot yeah. about that character. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I, I saw I him think... when we were doing research for Skull the Slayer. I'm like, wait, I forgot they even did one on this. Yes, <laughs> I NFL may Super have Pro. the first issue of that buried in my collection somewhere where I picked up a bunch of bulk comics. Probably. Pro we should so, do stats yeah. for him. <laughs> At which point, while I'm thinking about it, another thing would be interesting to read. It's not a Marvel title, but Atari Force. Oh, my Atari God. Force. I forgot oh about Atari God. Force. Who did Atari Force? That was DC? 
Was it? Was that a DC? Oh, okay. I think. Uh, yeah, Marvel Atari Force was DC. I actually picked up pretty much the entire run of it, minus the first issue for like a buck an issue at the local comic book store. So there yeah, was like was a DC. Some it ran for four years. Yeah. Oh wow, eighty-two. Hmm. Yeah. So the it would 86. be go into the Atari Force, so that way you could get your space sci-fi thing going on. This actually looks kind of cool. I forgot about it. Yeah, this. actually, I forgot about it. I was talking to the owner of the store about it. I just saw bought it on a lark because I thought it'd be funny and could some good show fodder. And the owner was of this comic book store was like, "No, this is actually a really good book." It's and just, I it, forgot about with those games that they list with Defender and Berserk when you bought them. There was the mini comics in them. Yeah, of Atari Force. Right. They that they did have. So yeah, that would yeah, be I something that. interesting to dig into as well. Dynamic Entertainment or Dynamite Entertainment re announced that they're going to redo the series with the Atari properties. Yep. Okay. Oh, do they even exist? Wow. <sighs> yeah. That those games, I think, are still owned by Atari. Yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah, those are still owned by Atari. So yeah, it's unlike the Saturday Super Kid cartoon, which you'll never be able to use again. The Super Kid cartoon, you said? Super Kid Saturday Super Kid. It had like Kangaroo and Donkey Kong. Oh and yeah, okay, Super Kid. That oh, yeah. it, it had all those like Atari, but uh, properties done. But they all weren't necessarily Atari, and they had them all as like shorts, like Qbert and in a cartoon. Mm -hmm. However, so many different companies owned the rights to those characters. You could never; it's just a pain in the butt to get everyone to sign off on releasing them. Holy crap! Seven seasons it went. <laughs> yes, it ended in '85. I remember it. I don't remember watching it for that long though. Wow. Well. Yeah, it's like I remember. I re oh, can remember CBS. a couple seasons of it. I don't remember it being five, but then seven, again, when, seven, seven. Nineteen eighty-five well, is when it ended. Well, actually, I was about five when it ended. Well, if it ended, in, yeah, I was. It was probably about five when I started watching it. Actually, it only went for two years, but it had seven seasons. Well, what happened <sighs> because they were shorts? Yeah, they were shorts combined in. So I think the way they did their uh, cartoons. It's kind of like the old Mary Melodies Looney Tunes shorts. Yeah. You know? If you try to make those into seasons, it's not the typical 22 episode season. So, but did yeah, that's something that. Did it have Mr. T in it too? No, Mr. T had his own cartoon. Yeah, I was going to say, I thought Mr. T had his own. Yeah, because I actually have the board game for the old Mr. T cartoon where he had like a bunch of different kids, I remember. Mr. And... T, yeah. Mr. The Mr. Oh God, Mr. T and the Muscle Machines was it? No, that was somebody else. No, it was Mr. T like Team or something? I don't know. Yeah, but yeah, and and that's another thing you could do in this game: the A Team. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Yeah, Airwolf. Oh, yeah, actually, no, it's just called Mr. T. Yeah, just Mr. T. Yeah, I'm thinking of the board game. He I runs a gymnastics yet. team. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I forgot about that cartoon. That Rambo and a whole bunch of them. Chuck Norris. Gosh. Oh, yeah. Oh, 80s cartoons. <laughs> mm. uh, anyway. Uh, we also got another uh, website comment here. It is just he would like from Slobberknocker. Would like to see a section of each show and stat out of here as they appear in the, what's like the movie versions. Good old, like good old JR, right now, right, Matt? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good old, it's going to be a slobber, Dr. D. What's some, maybe do a, like a contest of champions where we actually like do a battle between the two heroes or villains. Or, or two villains, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think we tried doing a lot of actual play stuff when we did RFI, and it wasn't well yeah, received. Yeah, it didn't go over very well. It, it's the, 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 it, sa it sounds interesting in concept, Yeah, but when you actually play it out, it's really not that entertaining. Yeah. Uh, I think you would have more fun sitting around just us talking about who do we think would win and bounce riffing off that than you would actually us role-playing out a yeah. combat. 
just yeah. from experience from when we were doing role for initiative we did we role played out combat with some monsters a few times and it could hit the point where it just kind of bogs down the show however it now if we did something where we made up like our march madness bracket of heroes and villains and had who would come out on top and like a voting thing or something that could be interesting possibly you would have to start with yeah you know, that's a little bit of <laughs> that that yeah that's a little am yeah yeah a little ambitious yeah a little ambitious but yeah all right cool i think that's it so right that, yeah that clears so. out the good old uh bullpen here so please write in classic face rip podcast you can write us at bullpen at classicfacerip.com or go to our website, classicfacerip.com and leave a comment on the website. Yeah. And uh, we're going to wrap it up this week and uh, say good night, everybody. And we'll see you next time.